Hello, I'm Gotham Paul from NZ Blockchain Forums and welcome to another edition of Blockchain Bytes. Today, I'm delighted to have on our talk someone who has written seven books and published over 100 articles on topics such as growth theory, economics of cities, innovation common, uh, crypto economics and blockchain. He's developed new methods and theories to explain wrong, long run sorry, economic transformation and pioneered several new fields of analysis, including his recent work on institutional crypto economics. Jason Potts is a distinguished professor of economics at RM RMIT University and co-director of the Blockchain Innovation Hub at RMIT. He's also an editor of the Journal of Institutional Economics, vice president of the international Joseph A. Schumpeter Society, a board member of Australian Digital Commerce Association, a fellow of the British Blockchain Association, and a member of the steering committee of the Australian government's national blockchain roadmap. Very long introduction, Jason, but all the way from Melbourne, Australia, and please welcome Professor Potts to Blockchain Bytes. Before we sort of get uh, into the Q&A, <laughs> let's um, just find out, let's delve a little bit deeper into sort of your um, journey into the field of economics and blockchain, and how did it all begin? Yeah, thank you, Gordon. That was a, a, a tr tremendous introduction. It makes me sound way more impressive than I, I really am. Um, but look, I'm an economist. Um, I've been working in the field of um, the nature and causes of long-run economic growth. Like that's that's the thing I do. And the short answer to that is new technology. So I've, I've often studied, I mean, I'm, the, the work I've, I've been doing is trying to study the economics of frontier new technologies. And about seven, eight years ago, we started getting, uh, um, we're looking at 3D printing and we were looking at sort of some early AI stuff and we we're looking at this new thing called sort of crypto and blockchain. And that was just one of the topics that myself and my team of, of postdocs and PhD students were looking at, but we just went down the rabbit hole and got completely obsessed with this blockchain thing. And about five years ago, six years ago, we approached the university and said, look, we've got a great idea for a new research center. We want to set up a new research center that's just devoted to sort of business applications or the you know, economic applications of this new technology, which we argued was going to be sort of, was going to have some fairly profound effects on the economy. Mm -hmm. um, that was a long time ago. Um, we've since sort of built the, the, the research team up to we've got about 25 academic staff here now oh, wow. um, doing that. So, and you know, we're amongst one of the best research centers in the world in, in this area. Um, we're gradually expanding it out to other sort of web three digital technologies um, beyond just crypto and blockchain. But that was, that was where it started. Okay, fantastic. And, um, Obviously, RMIT is where the, your main focus is right now, if I'm correct. And it has its own blockchain innovation hub. What type of products are being worked on there? And how many, or, um, how many have or are gaining traction in the real world of crypto economics? Yeah, so the, the Blockchain Innovation Hub, that's the research center that we, we founded here. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing about it, we call it a hub because if we called it a research center, there was all sorts of... Um, administrative requirements that research centers had. So we called it a hub because no one knows what a hub is. But what it means is that we're, we're involved in primary just blue skies research um, with the teams of economists and lawyers and accountants and marketing and finance people, just, just business school types into that. Um, we do a lot of work with industry, especially startups, where we're, we're working with startups to try and help them understand um, what use cases they can bring, what sort of areas and so on with that. And we, we also do a lot of work um, building courses for students um, right across the board um, in, in all of the different applications of that. But to answer your question, what we, we work across every single area. So we do supply chain stuff, we do finance stuff, we do um, smart contract you know, trade infrastructure stuff, mm -hmm. things in you know, particular industry verticals such as agriculture and health, um, supply chains, um, real estate is, 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 is real estate and property is, is, is one of the areas that we've been we've been working in. But just really, um, the thing about this new technology is it's um, blockchain technology is, is basically next generation of the internet. It's digital economic infrastructure, and commerce. Mm -hmm. So it goes everywhere. Right? This, this, it's not a it's not a sector of the economy that you know, the digital crypto part of the economy. It's just everywhere that there is. Um, identity payments, money, contracts um, that are involved. That's, that's where this, this tech ends. So, so, so with that in mind, we end up um, doing a lot of different sorts of projects. Um, a lot of these ones are still very early stage. This is a very early experimental new technology still. 
um, even though we're sort of about 10 years into it. Yeah. Um, so a lot of it is sort of proof of concepts. What can we do with this? How will this work um, in these sorts of areas? So a lot of just very early stage, trying to understand the impact of this new technology in these particular new sectors. Mm -hmm. And your latest report that came out um, prepared by the RMIT's Blockchain Innovation Hub, the idea behind it was for the Real Estate Institutes of Australia and New Zealand yep. to look at and explore sort of what both the opportunities and the disruptors are um, for blockchain technologies. Is that, uh, is that correct? Yeah, so that's correct. So um, I was one of the people involved in this. Um, um, Dr. Sarah Sinclair was the person that actually led the project on, on, on all of this. But what we found is that industry associations are actually, we often have them as clients um, where we're, we're doing work for an entire sector where the basic question that the sector has is what impact will this new technology have on this sector? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we're absolutely thrilled to work with, with, with Real Estate Australia and New Zealand and they sort of combined forces to, to have a, an exercise in just trying to think through all of the possible impacts, disruptions, opportunities to map those out for their, 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 um, for their, for their own um, stakeholders mm -hmm. and to, to feed that report back where we, we tried to sort of look through um, all of the different points of potential disruption um, that could come in the future, the ones that were actually happening now where we're seeing um, individual companies or startups or, 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 or agencies doing work to try and implement this technology and to look at um, possible regulatory issues, adoption issues, education and skills issues, um, just the broad gamut of what type of disruption this, this tech is bringing. You know, in much the same way that you would have had the same discussion 30 years ago with internet, right? What is the implication of the internet on, on, on the sector? And some of that was fairly obvious, straightforward things. Well, you know, um, you know, websites, for instance, or search engines. And then others were trying to sort of imagine you know, a, far, a far more distant horizon where you've got you know, digitization of things. Well, we've had the same, the same process going through where we're looking at the implications of blockchain technology for the property real estate um, sector. So I can, I can walk you through some of those things you found. If it's... No, I mean, what my next question, that leads perfectly to the next question, really. Is, I mean, in terms of, for anyone who's actually involved in the real estate business right now, What's it going to mean for them in terms of, you know, what should they be aware of in terms of the impact and the future changes that are going to hit them? Because we know, I mean, this box has been opened. <laughs> it's yeah. coming. It's not a matter of um, if, it's a matter of when. Yeah. So look, the, the, the same thing that we see with any sort of dramatic or any significant technological shift, um, short run effects, probably small, long run effects, profound. Mm. And the, the thing about um, blockchain technology or cryptocurrencies or tokenization of, of, of things is that it's fundamentally economic infrastructure. So it doesn't sort of, it, there's a bunch of things that won't change um, that the sort of retail end of things will say, will say more or less the same, yeah. but fundamentally property, the property industry is a, a record keeping industry. It's, it's about someone owns a thing. And when you sell something, you have to transfer that ownership. That's a change in a registry. Um, now, that is a costly exercise that needs to be done very, very carefully. Um, so, so we have, so there's a possible upgrade of the existing property registry infrastructure. Um, but then on top of that, there's one person can own something, multiple people can own something. So we have new ways of creating more distributed, fractionalized ownership of a thing. Um, we can take a single object like a house or a building and break it into its component parts, which might be rooms or access or doorways or things to access things. So we can start to have more complex ownership and access and control of those things that then extends out into the rental um, market where mm -hmm. we, can, we can start to sort of tokenize access to rooms or tokenize access to uh, other sort of parts of things. So there's, so the, there's a sense in which um, on the one hand, it's just taking existing things, ownership records, payments, registries, and so on, and moving them into a purely digital format. But then once we do that, that gives us new affordances where we can start to add sorts of other features to it um, with that. So there's, there's that, sort of, that sort of extension. Um, but it's, it doesn't just stop there. So there's other things around, um, you know, blockchain is just simply a records keeping technology. So yeah. it's not just, it's not just the, the asset that we need to keep track of. It's the um, tenants or other sorts of so other sorts of things where we deal with identity management and KYC and 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 other aspects of um, that that then extends out into um, um, keeping track of um, just 
references and referee reports and other sorts of documents where we need a consensus view of what was the state of this building? What is the state of this room? What is the state of that maintenance work that was done then? So just any situation where we need to be able to keep track of um, facts about a building, about a person, about work that was done to a thing, all of those sorts of, you know, administrative infrastructural record keeping details mm. that traditionally we've relied on third parties such as the the you know the builder that did it there was some records kept hopefully or the bank there was hopefully some records kept yeah. all of that that's the the stuff that is being just that is being disrupted by this new technology and the idea is is that if we can dramatically lower the costs of establishing truth about what happened when to whom and what and who exchanged what when going all the way back um, and that the, the costs of adding that information fall just the infrastructure for the property sector for um, for the entire you know, for the entire sector just becomes more efficient better um, like that that's the better faster cheaper story there mm. um, so yeah I mean obviously there are going to be a lot of concerns I mean one of the things that suddenly just jumped into my head is governance. Because I mean, let's say, for example, I buy a property halfway around the world in a country that doesn't have proper um, official ties with um, with here, um, and at some point somebody decides to move into that property or, or takes it over without my knowledge. How how would we deal with that in terms of actually registering it so that it is de facto one hundred percent proven? Yeah, I'm so trying to say it's going to be on the blockchain. Yep. So look, that would be it would be amazing if we had a global system that worked seamlessly. You know, but remember that's what the internet is, right? The internet yeah. is a communication system that is digitally native, that enables computers to be connected together to enable communication to work without. Doesn't matter where it is, right? So that's amazing for communication. We do not have that system for assets in the mm. world. It, assets are all registered country by country, and it, even then, even then, that's as good as it'll, it'll hopefully get. Some countries worse than others. Um, and property is a physical thing, right? It's not a, it's not a digital object. It's in the in the real world. So we still need to rely on actual enforcement of laws and contracts. Um, you know, using court systems or uh, you know other. Other, other things that establish that that connect to the real world all that blockchain can do though and this is a this is a this is a big thing is it can create a a record keeping system that i can i can i can establish that i did that then and i can take that to a court and and we, we can verify that it hasn't been tampered with or that it is a that it is mm -hmm. a, a true account of of facts as they were then um now again you know that's that's um, that's not a miracle. That's a, that's just a, a little piece of, a, of of an additional puzzle. But a lot of the cost of owning property overseas, or the cost of trying to run businesses in, in jurisdictions that aren't your own, yeah, just the enormous layer of even even just establishing that something happened, establishing that you bought something then. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, um, this is you know all we're dealing with here is just the administrative bureaucratic record keeping layer. That is not just associated with property titling and, and and the registries of ownership. It's also associated with things like um, maintenance records, um, photographs of what happened, um, evidence of, of who who owned what what when. Just but other corroborating evidence that all goes into the to yeah the, sort of the, yeah creating value. Mm. Okay, I mean, in your report, you also you, you you refer to the fourth industrial revolution. What exactly is that to you? Yeah, so fourth industrial revolution, I think it's a term was coined, coined by the World Economic Forum people. Um, we prefer the word Web3, but it's kind of the same thing. It's basically this idea that there's a super cluster of technologies that have happened in the past decade or so. And these technologies are, what they all have in common is that they're digital. So this is um, AI and machine learning. Right, which is useful for controlling robots and, and, and doing search functions and so on. You've got um, 3D printing, which is basically about turning digital instructions yeah. passed through a machine to make physical objects. You've got blockchain, which is the base layer record keeping for doing money and payments and infrastructure and, and so on. Um, we've got Internet of Things, which is sensor devices that go from digital into a, a sensor and so on. Um, quantum computing will come along at some point soon. Um, but, you know, basically technologies of digital automation. Um, 
that have this common layer of, 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 of digital. And the thing about any digital technology is anything digital can talk to anything else digital. So you've got this, it's like a lingua franca that connects it all together. Mm -hmm. um, the fourth industrial revolution is just this idea that when you put all of those technologies together on this digital layer, what you have is a full economic stack of record keeping, automation, sense, um, ability to, to control and communicate and sense. Um, you've got ways for the robots to interact with the humans. You've got ways for the humans to identify themselves to the robots. Um, you've got this sort of way of enabling sort of software and data control of entire sort of systems. And the idea is that, that that's a revolution in the same way that you know, the first industrial revolution was you know, steam power and, and, and factory systems. Um, and the second industrial revolution was the scaling up of that. Fourth industrial revolution or web three as, as, as I actually prefer it, um, is this idea that this, this super cluster of digital technologies has all happened at once. And it is going to revolutionize or disrupt um, every sector. Right? In, in fact, I think my basic prediction is that sectors stop existing. Um, because what you have is this, 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 these new sort of infrastructural capabilities. And what I'd emphasize with you know, what this you know, fourth industrial revolution, what this digital supercluster brings, is it's not new consumer products. It's, that's not where the focus is. What this does is this is much deeper in the economy. This is at the level of um, money and payments and registries and, and property titling and contracts and organizations and all of the sort of economic infrastructure that previously used to be mostly physical or provided by governments or provided by large corporations um, is now digitally native. Mm -hmm. And we've never had it digitally native before. Um, the thing about, you know, the, the about commerce on the internet, about e-commerce, right? <laughs> Com sort of stuff mm. was that you still had to use banks, you still had to use credit cards, you still had to use passports or driver's licenses to verify who you were. You still had to, it was still backing down into, into um, you know, government registries or, or national court systems and so on. I mean, all, all of that is still there, but those things weren't digitally native. There was an internet layer of digital communication, but there wasn't a digital layer of, of, um, of administrative settling and, 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 and therefore the business models were always hybrid. So what we ended up with was a world where a small number of companies got very, very big, the large banks, the large, you know, the you know, Facebook, Amazon, Google, you know, and yeah. so on. And what fourth industrial revolution web three brings us is the disruption of that, that we're now entering into a world where power and capabilities gets pushed right back to the edges again, where individuals and you know, small you know, groups of people coming together to do stuff can tap into those digitally native capabilities to organize their business, to make payments, to verify who they are, um, and, and to have that as, as a sort of a capability that works naturally on the internet, therefore at scale. Hmm. And you know, this will be decade, maybe many decades, but. That's what the, the revolution that's just happened is, is this fundamental reinventing of economic infrastructure so that it's natively digital all the way down. And that's mm. never existed before. And for this part of the world, for sort of Australia and um, NZ, I mean, there are massive opportunities. I mean, do you have any examples sort of, uh, of Australia uh, and blockchain yeah. uses? Yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, I, I think that's exactly right, is that the, the huge winners on this are those at the edges. So it's not just it's you know, countries like Australia and New Zealand who are at the beginning of supply chains. We, you know, we have huge primary goods exports around the world. Yeah. And previously, that's been a weakness for us because we haven't been able to attach data to us or, you know, we, we were, we, you know we'd send commodities off and, and someone else would, would do all the work, um, you know, adding all of the administrative layers to that. So this is a huge opportunity for countries like Australia and New Zealand who are at the edge of, edge of supply chains, but it's also a huge opportunity for countries and you know, the, the citizens and people that live in them that hmm. have, that have you know, somewhat broken countries in the sense that there, there might be a little bit of corruption in the administrative processes or that the court <laughs> systems are slow. You know, and this describes almost everywhere in the world. Yeah. It's, not a, it's not a critique of any particular place. No. But it's just we've been utterly reliant upon if you weren't in you know, Switzerland, if you didn't have just amazing you know, public bureaucratic infrastructure, um, every country that wasn't that sort of paid a little bit of a tax um, for, for being able to access those things. 
this is a great, this you know, Web3 fourth industrial revolution, this digital tech stack is a great equalizer. And you know, I think that's, that's an incredible thing because it, it sort of means that high quality economic infrastructure can be available to seven or eight billion people instead of just one or two billion people. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you asked about sort of examples of, of where we're seeing use cases of this. Um, the first ones we're seeing are in finance. So a lot of the early applications of blockchain technology and crypto is really about um, finance and payments because that's the yeah. obvious yeah. place to start, right? Yeah. Those things are digitally native. Um, mm. It's, you know, there are significant costs in moving money around, um, around the world, especially yeah. if you're, if you're you know, especially if you're not a large corporation that has specialized in that. So that ability to, you know, to borrow or to, um, to, to access um, derivative markets or other types of insurance markets relatively cheaply and easily just, just through, through, through crypto is, is the first major use case. But I think what we're likely to see is, is um, the next big ones beyond that, the harder ones are into supply chains and, and, and trade. Um, I think, you know, property and real estate is sort of along the, the, the path of that. Um, the really hard ones will be health and um, other sort of areas where you've got really um, significant challenges around privacy and, and yeah. you know, the value of data. So there'll, there'll be a logic, there'll be an order in which these things roll out. Um, but finance is already well underway. Mm -hmm. and a lot of other industries are about to sort of come on board with this. Fantastic. I mean, I... Um, you, it was mentioned in your report that there's a couple of startups, particularly from the real estate point of view, um, Hutley and Propy. Have you sort of studied them a bit more in detail and see what they're doing and why they're they're, they're sort of going to be okay? Yeah, you know, so there's 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 actually quite a lot of, of startups in this space, and this is what we normally expect. Any new technology, it's it's not often the existing large incumbents that use the technology because why would they? There's no real advantage to, to them doing it. They've already got successful businesses, but there's huge advantages in startups coming in, adopting a new technology and experimenting to find out where the, where the advantages actually are. Um, so these experimental processes, um, traditionally out of every hundred startups that, that gets off the ground, you know, 99 of them will die. Yeah. You know, that's perfectly normal. Um, and, and I expect it'll be exactly the same in the, in the property space. Um, what we're seeing with, with, you know, with companies like, with, with, with startups like, like, like Proppy and, and, and others mm. is that they're experimenting with particular new business models around um, trying to solve particular problems around either lowering the onboarding costs for companies for, 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 for making payments for, for, tenant, for real estate tenants and so on, um, or wa wanting to try and tokenize particular assets to sort of take assets and try and um, enable us to um, have joint ownership of particular, of particular products. Um, so the, there's quite a few of them that, that are sort of solving particular niche problems. There's, there's, not, there's not a single sort of um, real estate startup that's come in and just tried to do the whole lot. Um, mm. Each of them are trying to do individual things. Um, it's still a bit early to see, to judge how successful these are. I mean, they're, some of them are getting you know, a lot of clients on board um, and you know, almost all of these have been venture capital finance. So they've usually got a few years of runway before we, we, we really see how that, that goes on. But, um, you know, um, I think, yeah, the, the point I'm sort of making here is this is still very early days. Um, we're seeing a lot of uptake and experimentation in this. Um, I'm hesitant to sort of suggest exactly where the, you know, which ones will succeed or, or, or where the future will be. Um, you know, in the same way that if I was trying to bet on internet companies in 1996, I almost yeah. certainly would have gotten it wrong. And I wouldn't have picked Google because Google didn't exist then. Um, same so here. it may well be that none of them end up surviving, but they give important lessons for future ones, or it may yeah. well be that some of them will stumble upon exactly the right margins. Um, and grow. But I, you know, I think what is exciting is that we're seeing um, a lot of venture capital is coming into the space to finance these experiments. Yeah. And we're seeing a number of um, early use cases that aren't exactly doing the same thing that the, 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 the current um, you know, real estate and property companies are doing. They're, they're, they're finding new niches in, in that space. Okay. And the, the report also identifies a number of sort of future directions for the real estate industry. One thing that's just popped into my head, and you mentioned it earlier when you were talking about hotels, is 
you know, about joint ownership and joint, joint usage and so on. There was, a, there was a talk about this when Airbnb first came into the world. Everyone said the hotels and the motels, they've got to change their way of working. Because, you know, historically, you've always, you've had to pay from when you can check in to when you can check out. And quite often that was, there was some dead air, dead time there. Yeah. Do you think they will actually start to change? Yeah, look, it, it, it could well be. Um, it's, I mean, I've, what I've been fascinated by is just the, the, the sheer number of different experiments that are taking place in this, in this space. So the thing about tokenization is it enables you to do things that you previously wouldn't be able to do. So one is joint ownership goes from a complex, difficult thing to trivial, because it's just, you just, if, if I hold the token, I've got ownership of it. If I split the token into five pieces with me, I've got five owners, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, there's all sorts of regulatory challenges around that that are, that are not, that are, you know, far from trivial slash impossible um, with current laws. So there may well be some regulatory updating, but from a technical perspective, um, tokenization of, a, of an asset enables me to split it into as many pieces as I like and distribute that. Now, that can be an ownership claim. If I hold the token, I have ownership, but it can also be a governance story. If mm. I hold the token, I get input into collective decision-making about the thing. So, um, you know, in that sense, we can have joint ownership so you know a lot of the housing crisis you know particularly for young people oh, is yeah. just that the the entry level is so high that you know i i can't own a tenth of a house or a tenth of an apartment i have to apply the whole thing um so right there is a possibility we, it's we, we can sort of we can have much easier um on ramps into the property markets by tokenization so that that's one possibility there. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also the ability to sell parts of a house without selling the whole house. I might, I might sort of sell access to or sell rights in this room, but not the whole thing. Um, mm -hmm. Now that's, that seems weird and unusual because a property title is, is about a, a, you know, there's a property title for a particular area. Yeah. The title itself isn't split, but a tokenization of that title can very easily artificially split it. So again, just there's lots of sort of entrepreneurial opportunities of things that can be done with this, that, you know, what I just described might turn out to be very, very bad ideas for reasons that will become <laughs> in the future, or they might be the obvious way forward. Hmm. Um, we can do, as I said, a lot of the initial use cases in crypto blockchain are around finance. Um, the reason for that is that we can do far more just real-time payments systems that are, that are just, um, that are specified in a, in a, in a or it's a lot easier to sort of, to um, have a complex design space over payments. And, um, and what that can mean is um, instead of having, you know, paying your rent, you know, a month, three months in advance or every two weeks or whatever, we can pay it every 12 seconds. Yeah. Um, and that payment can be conditional upon a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's just, a, and, and, and that's, 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 not a, that's not a costly thing to do. That's, that's cheap and easy and, and free. Mm -hmm. So the, the point is, is that the, the design space of what is possible around ownership payments, um, various conditions upon that, price feeds coming into things, is suddenly exploded. And that creates new entrepreneurial opportunities where, you know, if it's cheap and easy to, to, to do payments like this, what, what follows from that? Yeah. And that's what a lot of these sort of, um, you know, real estate and property companies are starting to explore is the, the new design space of possible business models that could work in here. Mm. Um, I think, you know, we'll, you know, this will, this is the next decade in this, in this industry is, is exploring those spaces. Um, and again, as I indicated before, a lot of them will be dead ends and a lot of them will be ideas that, you know, we tried that, it didn't work, there was nothing there. But some of those things we will alight on new types of design models around ownership, collective ownership, joint ownership, payments, access, um, just, just different structures between, you know, at the moment we've got you either own or you rent. And there's there's yeah. no space in between. Um, mm. That whole space could, could, could be filled up with more complex mm. things. So... Lastly, last question, and thank you so much for bearing with me. Um, there's still a degree of confusion around these technologies. I mean, what are, what's the best way of describing them and working with them? Do we ditch trying to explain how it works? Um, or is that the key part of the story that needs to be understood? No, no, it, it's a key part of the story that needs to be understood. And this is a, this is a new set of technologies um, the, the best way to learn about them is, you know, you can do our courses at RMIT. We, we, we have courses on this. Um, the second best way is just to experiment with them. This is one of these things that you learn a lot by doing. 
But my high level description of, you know, what is blockchain crypto technologies is that it's economic infrastructure is the, is the first key thing to understand. Um, it's economic infrastructure in the same way that money and registries and title systems and so on are economic infrastructure. What we've got now is a digitally native version of that yeah. um, that exists natively on the internet, which means that it exists not at the level of you know, Melbourne or Australia, it exists at the level of the world. It's, it's born global. Um, that's, so that's, that's the first thing. Second thing is, that what, the, what this technology does, the, the, the value proposition of it, is it establishes common knowledge. Right? And, and what common knowledge means is that you and I can agree that something is true and that something is true could be who is that person? Yeah. Um, what is the reputation score of that person? Um, who owns this asset? Who has the rights to do these things? So a bunch of common knowledge, um, you know, the you know, all economies run on common knowledge about ownership and identity yeah. and agreements and promises and so on. So if we have low cost common knowledge, you know, otherwise, you know, otherwise known as trust, if I can trust that information and that information is you know, natively digital or in software, there's all sorts of new possibilities that are created. Now, um, does this mean the property industry becomes automated? Not at all. What it means is that people working in the property industry now have far more powerful tools to design new ways of creating value. Mm -hmm. And I think just understanding that this is a, um, you know, this, this doesn't do away with real estate agents or property, you know, just anyone, but, but it does mean you'll be doing different things. And my suggestion is you'll be doing probably far more fun things. You'll be in the design space um, where you're trying to you know, trying to come up with new ways of designing things and then building those and implementing those in software and a lot of the sort of boring administrative record keeping just chasing up facts you know trying to figure out who owns this house or trying to figure out what type what liens are on the on the place or trying to figure out whether this person that you're wanting to lease this to is trustworthy but those are common knowledge problems if i if i knew true information about that thing it would all be a lot easier um, that's what this technology significantly lowers the cost of. Doesn't make it go to zero. Doesn't make it, the problem go away. But it just it just means that a hard, expensive, slow, boring process just suddenly got better, faster, cheaper. And with that, we can. In, this is this is an opportunity for the property industry to go into its real estate um, to go into its um, to to be you know, to become far more complex in what it can do and therefore far more value creating. So I mean, my argument is this is the best thing that's ever happened to the sector. Professor Jason Potts, it's been an absolutely invigorating conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and I am really looking forward to hopefully meeting with you sometime in the near future, <laughs> now that travel has started again. But once again, uh, you know, it's been great to hear from you and I look forward to keeping in touch. Absolutely, my pleasure, Adam. Thank you. Thank you.